that good? Okay, good afternoon. Um, we're going to uh, begin with a word of prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we invite you here into this meeting, into this study. We need your presence. And we know, Lord, that there are things that you want to teach us that we have to learn. And they come from learning in the school of Christ. We ask, Lord, that you can watch over each person searching for truth, that they can discover truth for themselves, that they can receive of your spirit to interpret your word, and that they can gain confidence and trust in you and in you alone. We ask, Lord, for help in this presentation. Um, that the problems we had in the previous presentation will not happen again and help us to hear your voice speaking to us. We pray for this movement, for all the different factions in it, and we pray for ourselves that can, we can reflect Christ's character. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, welcome everyone. Now, I'm not the one who's scheduled to speak at this time. It would be Stephen. But we had some te technical difficulties um, this, um, this morning, and those technical difficulties uh, made the meeting unlistenable. But I believe that those difficulties were purposeful on God's part. Um, definitely the presentation I was doing was not the presentation mm -hmm the way that God wanted it to be presented. Now, we went for a walk and we had a bit of a talk. And the one thing that we, this, the purpose of these meetings is not for us to tell you what to think. The purpose of this meeting, all of these meetings, is to help you understand the history of this movement and how God has led it and to give you the tools to help understand and analyze. Now, these tools are simple. God has given us Miller's Rules, and he has given us line upon line, and he has given us the symbolic use of numbers. And these are things that were given long before this movement existed. We just didn't know it. We weren't aware of it. And these things have come together in our history to correct us, reprove us, to show us our sin because we are unprepared to give a message, not just to the world, but even to Seventh-day Adventists. We're unprepared. And God needs to prepare us. And the way we started out these meetings yesterday is that the past is the key to the present. Amen. And we need to learn from the mistakes that have been made in the past. And one of the mistakes is trusting in the words of man over the words of God. Amen. And so the emphasis here, when we're looking at this line, Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar, I missed the main point of what this line is about. And I got flustered I started looking at the wrong line and drawing out the wrong line and wondered, why is this happening? And this is not about me as a presenter. I like to present clearly, concisely, as perfectly as humanly possible. Uh, but God sometimes wants to show us that we need to depend upon him. So these meetings are not about me or about any of the speakers here. This is about God. And this is not about us in opposition to anyone else, even Parminder, right? This is about the great controversy between Christ and Satan. And we can see this in this story if we have eyes to see and ears to hear. So I'm going to read what I wrote um, and comment on it for this first part, because we're learning how to draw out lines. 
right? We need to know how to draw out a line. And, and we're not saying that these lines that we've drawn out are the best lines, that we've chosen the best way marks, because we don't understand everything. I definitely do not understand everything, even though I've tried since I was a little child to understand everything. I definitely don't. But I want to understand, and I want to be able to share what I understand that God has shown us, but I want you to be able to test these things and understand them for yourselves. Now, we're all different, but the Holy Spirit can speak to each one of us. So when we look at Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar, it says prior to 9-11, indeed from 1989 to 9-11, we have a period of darkness. We have been in darkness in this movement. Now, that doesn't really make sense, does it? Because during that period from 1989 to 9-11, we had this first, the first angel's message being repeated in our history but we were in darkness to something. And what is it that we were in darkness to? Who was the enemy for eight years? His name was Kushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, right? His name characterizes this darkness, and his name is, um, it means, um, well, Kushan means blackness, but it refers to evil. And Rishathaim, it's referring to this, this double evil, right? This double wickedness. And he's oppressing the children of Israel. And so this period of darkness in this line of Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar, is about a darkness that has affected us. And this isn't about a darkness about someone else. This is a darkness about us. So if we look at 11989, we know that this is the first angel's message. But between this period and 911 is this period of darkness. It's God has given us a message in here but there is a period of darkness in relationship to zooming into the second angel's message on Jeff's line, which is 9-11. So this 9-11 is the second angel arriving. Now, I'm doing over this presentation because of the technical difficulties and because God wants a different emphasis in this presentation. And so some of the things I'm going to say in this presentation are similar to what I said before, but there are some things that we really need to pay attention to. So this darkness is about us. Because we're in this movement where light is coming to us, but we're still in darkness. And what are we in darkness about? We're in darkness about our spiritual condition. In order for us to receive light, we need the Holy Spirit to reveal to us, to, and, and I talked about this, this conviction of sin. But that conviction of sin, the focus was out there. The focus needs to be in here. Because we are all sinners. And without Christ, we can do nothing. And so Othniel, the line of God, is going to come to us and give us a message. It's an event. 9-11, it's the arrival of the second angel's message. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. But when we zoom into this line, when we zoom into this second angel's message, right? I shouldn't have put this here because this is the second angel message that's 9-11 on Jeff's line. But when we zoom into this one here, it becomes the first angel arriving in this context of this darkness. There is a double wickedness that exists within us. And God allowed 9-11 to happen to wake us up. Sure, the time of the end is 1989 in that bigger line, but in this line, this line of the history of this movement, as I was saying in the, the study that 
we're not going to put up because it's unlistenable. But in that study, I talked about we're the children of 9-11. That is, we are waking up at 9-11. And we're needing to see that God, in order to give us light, that message of 9-11 has to come to us. And that's Othniel. And this is a work that is going to change us. The enemy that characterizes this darkness, Kushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, is not an enemy that has been left in the land, but comes from Mesopotamia, meaning between the two rivers. This harkens back to Jeff's Time of the End magazine and the tale of two rivers. Kushan Rishathaim means double wickedness, and he oppresses the children of Israel eight years. Here we have symbols of the second angel's message that arrives at 9-11. It is the, the message of Othniel, the line of God, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, who goes to war against Kushan Rishathaim and defeats him. Othniel represents the first angel's message. Kushan means blackness. The darkness of sin is the first obstacle, obstacle that this movement must face. It is the line of the tribe of Judah that uses the fulfillment of prophecy to awaken us to our need. And I didn't give that message clearly in the first presentation. Now, we have these messages. So what we had laid out is in the book is these camp meetings. We had this series of camp meetings leading up to 2014. That is, God was giving us light on the prophecies of the significance of 9-11 at the Ozone Camp meeting. We now understand 9-11 in relationship to Islam. But remember, on this line, we're looking at 9-11 as the arrival of the second angel, not the empowerment of the first angel. But it's still on that line. And then we have Oklahoma, 2010, November 7th. That's the empowerment and that's when I meet Jeff. I'm in Oklahoma for the first time. And then on the 14th of November, 2010, Jeff is going to be presenting and the Holy Spirit is going to speak through someone in the, in the audience, in the congregation, who's going to present something that Jeff does not see and Jeff is going to recognize it as the work of the Holy Spirit. And we're saying that a change happened to this movement in 2010. That light began, began to come from all around rather than just from Jeff. Because before that, Jeff was giving studies and people are following what Jeff is doing. And he's led by God. But now light starts to come into this movement. And that what does light, happens when light comes into our presence? exposes sin. Now, right, and there's two different responses that we can have to light, right? We can accept that light and let it get rid of the sin in us, or we can be uncomfortable about that light and move away from it so that our deeds are not exposed. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. They hide in the dark, away from from the light. So this is what happens to people. And we know that in this movement, many people have come into this movement and have left this movement. And the question is why? Why is this movement not growing? Why does it keep getting smaller and smaller? It's fracturing. Well, the problem is we haven't accepted this message. We like to point out the faults in the church. We like to point out the faults in people around us, in the world. But we're not willing to look at ourselves. And this is a message. This whole book of Judges is a message to us about our spiritual condition and God's remedy. So these messages, the message of Kushan Rishathiam, is just the, it's this attack of the enemy of, of, that is expressed in the sin in our lives. And so this message of Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar is a message meant to reform us. 
Now, I'm going to read more of what I wrote. These messages cover the primary messages that unfolded after 9-11. While 9-11 is the arrival of the first message, it is not formalized until its understanding is presented in 2004. The Prophecy School in 2010, where Jeff and some of the other ministries presented the prophetic chain and where I first came into contact with this message, marks the empowerment of this message in two ways. First, it is here where Jeff attempts to draw various ministries deeper into the message while they resist. For one thing, their understanding of the book of Joel differs from Jeff's, and they take the four insects uh, to represent Islam, while Jeff sees them as an illustration of the fall of Rome. And their focus has been more on the 2520 rather than Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. Second, his attempt to direct their presentations by assigning topics for them to present is not welcome. The Prophecy School also commences with Jeff's 59th birthday. With all of the ministries present, God has put in place the opportunity for this movement to come together as on the day of Pentecost. But the grumblings, envyings, and posturing for position represent the work of the enemies, which is part of these lines. So when we look at this nine the line, we have November 7th, or, or pardon me, I'm um, going to do this wrong again. Yeah, we first have ozone. So we have ozone, which is in 2004, and then we're going to have November 7th, uh, 2010, and then seven days later, November 14th, 2010. So this is going to be, uh, I'm going to put it under here. The first angel arrives. The first angel is formalized. Uh, and I could use message, but I always do it this way. First angel is empowered. Second angel arrives. And so this is another message that needs to be empowered and formalized. Now, Ehud, this second message... So we got Othniel over here. He's the Lion of God. And then we have Ehud over here. And his name means unity. And then we have um, Shamgar as well which means a sword. But before we get to Shamgar, we have Newport in April 27th of 2012. Jeff presents at Newport on April 27th. And then on June 22nd, uh, 2000. And 12, they're going to put up, um, this is going to be uh, the two tables, Habakkuk's two tables. And then we have the third angel arrive. This is going to be Shamgar. And Shamgar means a sword. And this is the first, second, and third angel's message in this line. And this line is a zoom into a line of the judges. And in the line of the judges, it's zoomed into this first way mark in the line of the judges. And the first way mark in the line of the judges is 9-11. So it starts with 9-11, but it's dealing with that history of this movement, which is the increase of knowledge in that line of the judges. And in the second message today that I'm going to present after this one, uh, we're going to look at Deborah and Barak, which is the formalization of that message. But this is the light that came to this movement. So we had an increase of knowledge in this history.
right? We had this increase of knowledge. We have a second message arrive. Now, what is this second message specifically? Because we can see this is the work of the Holy Spirit through prophecy, taking this history of 9-11 and giving us an understanding. But when we get to here, the message is Ehud. It's about unity. But ironically, this is really where the division in the movement begins. But God is still bringing the people into unity because can he bring people into unity who are clinging to sin? No. So now what the church does, uh, we had a, uh, an anniversary at our church. I can't remember, 75th anniversary of our church or something in, in Warburg. And the conference president came out. And of course, he knows that I'm there. He knows who I am. He knows about the 2520. And so his message is slightly directed at him. And I don't think I'm just paranoid. I think, or at me, I mean, he, he slightly directs this message at me. And he says, in the Alberta conference, we have unity. And how's this unity achieved, do you think? Those that don't agree with us, we remove. Right? Now, is that how we bring about unity? No. No. But people leave because God brings about unity by doing what? Do people leave when the, when the work of the Holy Spirit begins? They leave on their own. <laughs> or, they, they, or they correct themselves. They're convicted and they choose to repent. Right. They're either corrected by the work of the Holy Spirit, they're corrected by the light that God gives, or they're not corrected and they leave. They've gone out from us, but we're not pushing people out from us, right? We want people to come together in unity. We're not going to criticize and label people and condemn them. What we want to do is come into unity with God ourselves, and we want to fellowship with one another and share the light that God has given us and listen to what God has done in other people's lives. Because the upper room is not one group of people coming with a self-righteous attitude and the other group of people apologizing to them. It's each one recognizing the part that they had to play in the disunity that existed between themselves. And, and this, so this message which was meant to be a message of unity, it caused a divide. And there was lots of things in this story which we don't have time to go into. The main story I'm going to look at is Shamgar. But we had all of these, these messages. And then in my notes, I look at Ehud. And the main thing that I looked at with Ehud is... Well, first I looked at the fact that we can take the Hebrew numbers. So when we look at Othniel, um, his Hebrew number is um, 6274. And uh, Ehud is 261, I believe. And then Shamgar is, uh, yes, 8044. And we can add these together, and we get this number, 14,000, uh, I think it was 14,579, yes. So this equals 14,579. And that number is um, very close to another number that, that we have. Right? So we have another number. If I had it as this number, 14,588, what number is that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah this is the number of days uh, from August 11th, 1980, uh, which is uh, Glacier View, to July 18, 2020. Right? But we also could look at uh, November 9th, 1989, 
and we could count the number of days. And this is going to bring us into 2029 uh, to the first day of the seventh month. But these numbers are closely related. They're only, um, what, 11, 11, uh, that's nine, nine, that's eight days apart, right? Eight days difference. 79 plus 9, so they would be yeah, nine, 9 days difference between these two numbers, right? 14579 plus 9 is 14588, right? So they're very close numbers. Um, <clears throat> and the story of Ehud had all, has all of these symbols, you know, and I'm going to just go over this again because I did do it before, but it needs to be here in this study that we are going to see. The enemies Ammon and Amalek possessing the city of the palm trees, which is a reference to Jericho and the seven times. Ehud's left-handedness, though he is a Benjamin, son of the right hand, that's what Benjamin means, and he has this two-edged dagger, it's going to be 18 inches, an 18-inch blade, and it's going to be on his right side, and he's going to reach with his left hand and pull it and put it into the belly of Eglon, king of Moab. And, and he's going to do that after he turns back when he sees the idols by Gilgal. And this is after he had delivered a, a gift already to Eglon. So he leaves, he comes to Gilgal, he turns back, and he asks for the audience of Eglon, king of Moab, in private. They close the doors. He's going to kill him. He's going to leave through the colonnade. And outside... Eglon's servants are going to be tarrying. And he, there's a blowing of the trumpet in the story, and that blowing of the trumpet points to September 11th, 2017, the first day of the seventh month. But it also refers to the first day of the seventh month in 2029 as well, because that's the Feast of Trumpets. So that date that we go to. So if we go back from here, just to uh, address this, if we go from this date... And we go not this many days, but subtract nine. And we get to the first day of the seventh month in 2029, which is October 10th. Uh, so it's the 10th day, 10th month symbol. We can see that this is also a blowing of the trumpets. So the story of Ehud with the blowing of the trumpet the Feast of Trumpets is also symbolized by this whole story. So I want people to read these notes and to spend time studying these passages. But the focus of this study is not so much about the symbols, even though the symbols exist in this particular study, but the focus that I wanted to have is on this period of darkness that every line has. That the reason God gives us a message is we need a message because we have a particular problem. And in 1980, in 9-11, it's the sin that exists. Now, often, Adventists think that the remedy to sin is the third angel's message, right? We hear about the third angel's message of righteousness by faith. But you can't have a third without a first and a second. And we know that all of the messages, the first, the second, and the third, are all about righteousness by faith because they're light and it's our response to light. Righteousness by faith doesn't just start at the end. It's a process that we go through justification, sanctification, and judgment. <clears throat> So, I want to go to the story of Shamgar, because this is really, uh, to me, the most powerful line in this story. Now, what we're doing is we're zooming into this message here, which is the third angel's message in this line, and we're creating a new line. This line of Shamgar... encompasses quite a bit. For one, is it's going to go all the way back 
to when <clears throat> light came to this movement in relation to how to study God's word. Because Shamgar is a sword, right? He's a sword. This is the word of God. And I asked a question. Why is the word of God a sword? What does it mean the word of God is a two-edged sword? Because it cuts two ways. Okay, it cuts two ways. And what are those two ways? Sinew from the bone. Yeah. And the thoughts and intents. It's a discerner of the thoughts. The joints and marrow. Yes. Um, so, for the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting, to, cutting asunder soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It is so fine that it can distinguish soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It can discern our thoughts and our motives. This is a work that we need God to do on us. But he has given us a prophetic message to do this. Often people think that we just need to study about Jesus' love, right? Contemplate upon how much Jesus loves us. Contemplate on the cross. Just, and, and those are good things to do. But has God just given us a devotional message as Seventh-day Adventists? No. He's given us a prophetic message. Often people will say, well, why do I need to study this? It's too complicated. But the question you should ask is, is it in the Bible? And is it true? That's what we need to ask ourselves. Because prophecy is in the Bible. Time is in the Bible. Dates and numbers are in the Bible. And you think that God just put that Ezekiel was prophesying on the fifth day of the fourth month for no reason? It's just, it's just a meaningless detail? Or that he lies on his left side for 390 days and 40 days? And, and we don't know what it means. We don't know when that period starts or ends. And if we don't know, should we say, well, we can't know, or we don't need to know? So if, if the Bible is not meant to be understood, if it's just some mystery, why do we even read it? So we're going to look at this line of Shamgar. <clears throat> now, as we know, uh, it's only one verse. Shamgar does not give us a lot to go on. But we're going to look at this. <clears throat> so. This line is going to start with Shamgar, a sword. Now, we say the sword is God's word. So we know that that sword arrives in our history. And can we say line upon line is a sword? Is that a sword, line upon line? Okay. So on October 5th, 2012, I did a presentation of line upon line. It's the first presentation I did in this movement. And even though this movement had been using line upon line, we generally did not understand what the verse in Isaiah 28 means. And in Isaiah 28, it says, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Right? In Hebrew, it's, Hebrew, it's tzav le tzav, kav le kav, right? It's tzav being a precept. It means to set up in order upon a line from here to here. When we are drawing a line in a story in the Bible, 
We're using line upon line. We're using Isaiah 28. And so I did a presentation on that on October 5th, 2012. And, and that symbolized this sword that's going to start this line. So it's going to start with this sword, the word of God. And 77 days later is going to be this Mayan calendar date, December 21st, 2012. This line becomes important in other, this date becomes important in other lines. It's not really a part of this line, so I just put it here to show you that there's something about this pr presentation in connection with another line. So that's 77 days there. So this is the first angel arrives. And then we're going to have the first angel is formalized. So if we understand that this is about the study of God's word, we're going to find that there is some keys that have to happen. Now, when we think about line upon line, the most powerful line that has come to this movement that connects us to Millerite history is Ezra 7.9. Okay? Now, Ezra 7.9, the question was proposed to me on August 31st, 2013 at um, Sylvan Lake camp meeting that we had organized. And it's represented by an answer. So Shamgar is uh, the son, right? He's the son of, um, I have it here, where is it? Yeah, he's the son of Aneth which means an answer. And so we're saying that to this line upon line, study is now an answer. So this is going to be August 31st, 2013. And this is Ezra 7-9. As a question. Jeff asked the question. Ezra 7, 9, the first day of the fifth month. Which day is the first day of the fifth month? And I have the answer to it. It's August 15th, 1844, because I know how the calendar works. But it's not going to be presented to this movement, because I'm nobody in the movement, until Noel presents it on June 22nd, 2014, that camp meeting that begins there. And it's, that's he slew, right? So we're going to look at that. So you got the first angel is empowered. And that's going to be June 22nd, 2014. Right? That's going to be Noel. Okay? He's going to present that message. Now, when we look at the word slew, it is 5 2 2 1. So that's the Hebrew slew is the Hebrew number H5221. H is for Hebrew. And if I write this backwards, so I just go like this, it's going to be the 12th month, the 25th day. And what is that? The 12th month, the 25th day. Christmas. That's Christmas. Does Noel have anything to do with Christmas? <laughs> so this witness is this word slew witnesses to the messenger who gives this message and empowers that Ezra 7 9, the line upon line. Okay? So we have something very powerful that happens in this message in relation to line upon line that we're unaware, unaware of, really, at the time. And then in 2014, I'm going to present at the camp meeting in Arkansas, the, the one in the fall, not the one in the summer, I'm going to present three studies on chronology. And those three studies are presented on two days, October 20th and 21st. Now, he's going to slew 
he slew 600 men. I'm just going to move this over here so I have more room. Um, but you're going to have the second angel arrive. And we're going to have this as October uh, 20 to 21 in 2014. And we have here the number 600 men. And this symbol here of 600 men, why is it there? <clears throat> now, we can take the number 600 and we can look at it in relationship to time. So I'm presenting time. And if we take 600 and we subtract uh, 600... 365. So if I take 600 and I subtract 365, the number of days in a year, I get this number, 235. What is 235? Right. So this is the number of months in 19 years, right? Metonic cycle. This symbol is presented at this camp meeting, as well as um, dealing with how we understand time. So we got 235 months. Now, if I take uh, three, um, and I guess I wrote it here as 365 divided by 235. Um, I don't know if that's the right way to do it. I'm going to just grab my calculator here. So I'd actually do 235 divided by 365. Where is it the other way around? 365. 365 divided into 600. I somehow can't remember how I did this calculation. So it's not 365 divided by 235. Okay, let me see here. Yes, that's right. So I should have done 235 divided into 600. Okay. My wife's better at math than I am. <laughs> so 235 uh, divided by... Right, so it's over 600. I guess I could have just drawn a line there. Equals 0.391666. So what do we have there? These are symbols. These are things I presented at the camp meeting. I did a study on the 391 years of the kings. Right? That's 391.5. But I did a study on that. I also did a study on the 666. That is the 666 years from the captivity of Jehoiachin until the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So these numbers, this 600 here, I can use it to illustrate the messages that I gave in 2014 at that camp meeting. Now that was a message about chronology. Was that message important for this movement, the people in this movement to receive? Yes. Okay. And could they have received this message if this message had not first done its work? No. So this message has to do its work. And then this message comes. Now, in reality, very few people in the movement receive this message. Jeff does. Right? He invites me to that camp meeting because he heard me in Alberta presenting on chronology. But his right-hand man at the time uh, was not very happy about it. And that would have been um, the guy from, uh, what's that? Mark Bruce. Mark Bruce, right? So he was not happy. And, and I don't know what goes on in a person's heart, but he did not like me for whatever reason. Um, he told me that I was teaching error, but you know he wasn't going to tell Jeff that. At least he didn't, I don't think. Though Jeff told me all kinds of people, 
opposed me all the time and he constantly supported me in what I was doing. People were warning him about what I was doing. I was time setting all different kinds of things, moving the landmarks, uh, rejecting dates on the charts and all these types of things that they imagined I was doing. <clears throat> now then we have, uh, he, he slew 600 men with an ox goad. Now an ox goad, what is it used for? Goating, Goating oxes, right? Oxen. <laughs> okay. Now it's used metaphorically to refer to instruction or teaching. Now, we had this message of chronology arrive, that 391, right? That's there. On July 16, 2016, an ox goat came. A plowing also began because oxen plow. Right, so first you're going to have an oxen plowing, right? And then you're going to have the goad, which is teaching. So this message of chronology has three way marks attached to it. The arrival, the empower, a formalization, and empowerment. It's going to be formalized on July 16th. July 16th, 2016. And that's going to be Josiah, Right? This is the second angel formalized. The message of Josiah is going to be the 391.5. It's going to be Josiah Lich as well. The connection between the 395 year, 391 years and um, 15 days and the 391 years and 6 months. 391.5. That's going to be on July 16th. That's a formalization of this message of chronology here. But it's going to be empowered September 7th, 2017. Now this is connected to Samuel Snow's letters. And the symbol that we have here from this scripture for this is... Um, it says, so just to read this again, um, he, um, after him was Shamgar the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox gold, goat, and he also delivered Israel. Now this word delivered means to be open. So what, what does it mean to be open? What is delivered? What's open here? Do you open letters? Samuel Snow's letters are going to be opened. Yes. Right? We're going to examine his letters and read them. Okay? And, and I put September 7th, 2019. You should have corrected. This is September 23rd. 2019, 17th, 2017, yes, there we go, <laughs> okay, and I, I was really jumping ahead there, so September 23rd, 2017, and that is going to be the first day of the seventh month, that's going to be uh, the Revelation 12 sign prophecy, But it's really that Samuel Snow's letters are opened and we get the symbol of July 18th, the publication of his last letter there. And this is going to be the third angel, uh, or the, pardon me, this is the second angel empowered, right? And this presentation, uh, Clayton was there and that's when he really became interested in what we were doing. Jeff's son, yeah. He was definitely convicted by this presentation on Samuel Snow's letters. This is at Lambert Church. It was after a series that I had done from September 11th to September 22nd, and then I was asked to do the sermon, and I'm going to leave on the Monday. So that was on Sabbath, of course, the sermon. And, and that's what it was on, was the symbol of July 18th, the prediction before midnight. 
And that's going to be, and I, I think I'm doing this wrong, though. I know I'm doing this wrong. Yes, that's what I did wrong. Okay, so this is not Samuel Snow's letters. This is, this is going to be Samuel Snow's letters uh, as well. That's the problem. Okay, so let me get this right. So on July 16th, I present Josiah Litch. On this one, I am going to present uh, July 18th. So the 187 is going to be presented. But this is the goad, pardon me. So this is the goad, which means to teach. And that's what I'm here at the School of Prophets to do. I'm actually teaching there. I was invited in as a teacher. So from, uh, from 9-11-2017 to 9-22, I'm going to present. And then on September 23rd, I'm going to give that message. So I'm going to teach in that period of time. And then this one, that's why it's getting mixed up. This is the third angel arriving. This is the second angel empowered. I know it's pretty messy here. And this is the one that means to deliver, to be open, be opened. Now, this does relate to Snow's letters as well, which is why I was getting confused about it. Um, now, this is October 13th, 2018. So what happens here? We're going to have the 391.5, right? So this message that was back here, right? This 391.5 is presented here. And this is the second message dealing with this chronology. So in order to be benefited by the third, you have to be benefited by the second. To receive the third, you have to be benefited by the second. And how does October 13th, 2018 relate to Samuel Snow's letters, to these letters being opened? And also they're delivered too. Letters are also delivered and opened, right? <laughs> so we got delivered and opened. And we know the reason why Jeff accepted the whole message of July 18th was because it's connection with Samuel Snow's letters. Because Jeff was presenting in 2018, he was presenting Samuel Snow's letters. That's what he was that was his main message he was presenting. He came to Alberta in, um, uh, in August. Uh, I think he was there August 6th to 11th. Um, and he presented Samuel Snow's letters, which I had presented the year before in 2017. But he now understood them. And so when we started to go through this presentation of November 9th and then July 18th, we saw the structure of Samuel Snow's letters. And I'm not going to be able to do that presentation here now. But we saw the structure of Samuel Snow's letters. And Jeff knew that this was something that would be impossible to have manufactured. He saw Christ's fingerprint in it. And so he knew it was truth. Now, the way I drew this out, I didn't have room for the fourth angel arriving. But the fourth angel arriving, the repeat of this history is July 18, 2020. So that's, that's what I have written on the page. So we have, so if we go over this line, <clears throat> we have this line upon line, October 5th, 2012 presentation. This is the message of Shamgar, it introduces this sword a two-edged sword. It's line upon line. Now, 77 days later, we have this witness, and this witness is going to be um, the Mayan calendar, and it's going to talk about July 18th, 2020, because it's uh, 1,872,000 days from the start of the Mayan calendar. So it's the 13th Bactoon, right? This is 144,000 for each Bactoon. And if you take 144,000 and multiply it by 13, you get 1,872,000.
right? And this also connects to this other chiasm, um, because this is actually about another line as well. But that 77 days there represents it. We know this is pointing to November 9th, right? 2019 for 391.5 days and September 23rd is 777 days to November 9th, 2019. So it's a pretty messy board there, but you can see what I'm saying about this message, that this message of Shamgar is part of this message. It's a zoom in to 9-11 on the line of the judges, which is a zoom in to 9-11 as the second angel arriving in Jeff's line, which is a zoom into the Sunday law on Ellen White's line. And so God has given us a message that needed to be understood in order to address the problem of sin in our lives. That it happens to be connected to chronology is God's doing, not mine. You know, we've had people who try to blame me personally for what happened with July 18th. But did I, was I the one who brought, who promoted July 18th in the movement? No. That was Jeff. Now, did I find those things? Yes. Yes. But Jeff chose to publish them. I didn't do anything against the movement's wishes. I didn't come and attack the movement or question anybody or suggest that I was some kind of a prophet or something they need to listen to me. I was just studying this message and sharing what I found in God's word. What the movement did with it was its choice. But most in the movement rejected that message. And that was evident after July 18th. Because if they had accepted it, they would have seen what truth it was. And the truth that it was showing us is that we were unprepared for the work that we, we imagined that we were prepared for. We thought we could give a message to the world. And we can't even tie our own shoes, spiritually speaking. Right? Correct. Okay. So this is what we need to recognize. And we can have these studies here at Telford Muse. And we can tell people that we're teaching the truth. But if we do not have the character of Christ, it, it won't matter. Even if, if what we're saying, some of it's the truth, it's going to be God's spirit that's going to accomplish the work. We are studying for ourselves and we're sharing what we have found and we're asking you to study for yourselves. And I'm not the authority. You know, if somebody has a question, I'm not the one to decide whether somebody else is right or somebody else is wrong. Right? That's the work of the Holy Spirit. So I make an observation here. This is in the closing part of this presentation. As we proceed with each of the following lines, we will do much the same in pointing out the symbols and their connection to events in our history. Now, why do we need to know our history? They're doomed to repeat it? Yes. And... Now, we need to be careful that we do not bring our feelings regarding individuals into these lines. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. It is the errors that are the enemies, not the people. Further, we need to see the underlying principles that were at work. Parminder operated secretly. If he had simply presented what he was thinking for all to see and evaluate without an agenda and accepting the Lord's leading, things might have been different. The July 18 truth was not presented in this way. It unfolded in the movement without any persuasion or subterfuge. Truth needs not man to provide power for its acceptance. It only requires that we obey it and accept it. Maybe not in that order. If it is truth, it will stand and it's time to be present truth 
will always be in God's providence. The message of Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar address these principles. The work of the Holy Spirit is threefold. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will prove the world, the church, this movement, you and I, of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you could not bear them now. Well, this work is cosmic in scope, the great controversy applies to each of us individually. If we see the messages as a means to compare ourselves to others, to justify ourselves in our own minds, and excuse our sinful course, we are in a worse condition than those we oppose or those that oppose us. Jesus has many things to say. Can we bear them? Can you join me as we close in prayer? Mm-hmm. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for your convicting power of your Holy Spirit. We, for, we ask for forgiveness for our sins and the times that we lean upon the arm of flesh instead of upon you. We pray for the people in this movement. We pray for ourselves. We know we are in grave danger. You have given us light and we need to heed that light. We know, Lord, that you love us and care for us and you want what is best for us. Help us to trust in you and what you are trying to do. Help us to encourage one another and not to tear down that which you are building up. Forgive us for our words, our thoughts, our actions that have hindered your work and continue to be with us throughout these meetings. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.